I've been crucified with Christ I've been crucified with Christ I no longer live but Christ lives in me We welcome you to our Bible study today The Apostolic Doctrine of Eschatology This is part two of the subject of the rapture We've been examining what the scriptures have to say about this event that happened in the first century. Let's examine where the teaching of the last days, the end of the world, and this secret rapture doctrine came from. We are going to see that like a snowball rolling down a hill, it has picked up many things down through the years. These things simply contradict Scripture. Futurism is wrong. When did this teaching begin? Where did it come from? A Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera of Salmenia, Spain, in the year 1591, wrote a commentary of 500 pages about disproving the claim of the European reformers that the Pope of the Catholic Church was going to be the Antichrist, or was the Antichrist. Ribera taught that the Jewish temple that was destroyed in AD 70 would be rebuilt by an individual called the Antichrist. It would not be the Pope of Rome, but it would be an individual that would abolish the Christian religion, deny Christ, pretend to be God, conquer the world. He would be an atheistic political superman of the last days. Now this is a man-made futuristic doctrine about Antichrist. And when you look through history, you see some of the results of things that were written to try to take the heat off the Pope of Rome, take the heat off the papacy, try to get people to look way down the road in the future for a coming individual called Antichrist. It was at that time in history that the Bible began to become available to the masses of people. The Romish priest saw that they could no longer keep the people in ignorance. Ribera wrote to point the people away from the papacy of Rome as the Antichrist and to cause them to look off into the future for an unknown individual at the end of time. Thus the structure of futurism became enlarged and adopted by a growing number of Protestants in the 19th century. This futuristic view was further popularized by an Italian cardinal named Robert Bellarmine in the year 1542 to 1621. He wrote that Paul, Daniel, and John, they never said anything about the papacy. So when you begin to look in history and you discover futurism and what it was all about, it was to take the heat off of the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church at that time. And it simply snowballed. It went in a lot of different directions. Samuel Maitland in 1866, he was the librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He wrote a number of books confirming futurism. As it went along, it picked up people, it picked up more man-made ideologies. James Todd, a professor of Hebrew in Dublin, Ireland, he became a follower of Maitland. More and more futurism began to take hold in Protestant circles. The theory of God taking the church out of the, wor out of the world arose, and this eventually led to two second comings. This idea came out of the book of Thessalonians, chapter 2, in a supposed secret rapture, and began fueling the belief of a last day's great tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. This last day's great tribulation period would be seven years long. It was the 70th week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. This seven-year covenant was going to be made with this individual called Antichrist. And it was going to, he was going to sit in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. 
the first three and a half years of this covenant would be good and the last three and a half would be bad. We must always remember that the Bible cannot mean what it never meant. The word rapture is not a Bible word. And the teaching of a secret pre-tribulation rapture of the church was relatively unheard of and not taught until the early 1800s and then not widespread until nearly early 1900. Another Jesuit priest named Emmanuel Lacunza, he wrote a book in 1826 about a coming rapture. Most scholars agree that a secret rapture belief came into prominence around 1830 by a group of people in Scotland called the Plymouth Brethren under the direction of John Nelson Darby, 1800 to 1882. Darby introduced this pre-tribulation rapture theory in Europe and later in America. When it was introduced, it was popularized in America when it was included in the notes of the Schofield Reference Bible in the year 1917. It was also included in the elaborate end time event charts published in Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth Charts in 1918. During the 20th century, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church became the dominant view. Its central passage of scripture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 15 through 18. Church history always viewed these scriptures as being resurrection passages. Now these are the things that we find in history that have come along like snowball theology and have been added to produce this ideology called the rapture. But really what does the Bible say about a pre-tribulation rapture. What does the Bible say when it comes to what God's will was for the believers? Here's some things to consider. Number one, Jesus prayed that we would not be taken out of the world to escape tribulation. In John chapter 16 verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And John 17 and verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Now a lot of people think a rapture is a way of escaping death. But the scriptures are very plain when it says that physical death awaits all men. You're going to die physically in this life. The death that Jesus came to defeat was spiritual death. If you don't understand the death that Adam died, you're not going to understand the life that Jesus came and restored. In Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7 and verse 2, the scripture said this, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living shall lay it to his heart. In the book of Romans, <coughs> chapter 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and verse 19, the Bible said this, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So the scriptures basically have been telling us that physical death awaits every human being. There is no escapism through a secret rapture. 
it's just not going to happen because futurism is a man-made doctrine. Futurism is wrong. Number three, any escape from planet Earth is not the subject of any Old Testament resurrection prophecies to be fulfilled by a future coming of Messiah. It's just not in there. They never said anything about it because it was never going to happen. The rapture is a man-made belief. It's not in the Bible. It's just simply been candy-coated to be presented to people as an event yet to happen. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 and verse 17. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive or remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as to veil upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, and we are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. These letters... These epistles were written, written to people who were expecting the Lord Jesus Christ to come back in their lifetime. Paul's we was them. He says we and you multiple times in the scripture. That was meaning Paul and his brethren, his readers. It was all about them, written to them, for them, about things that were getting ready to take place in their generation. Paul's called up of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, and Jesus gathering together, Matthew 24 and 31, were describing the same event that was getting ready to happen. The New Testament was written in Greek, which is a more elaborate and descriptive language than English. For example, the Greek word translated air a better understanding of the Greek meaning will help you to better grasp the reality that Paul was expressing to his first century readers. Two words are translated as air. One is aranos and refers to the air where birds fly and higher above the mountains in the atmosphere. The other word for air is aer. This is the one Paul uses in Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17. A-E-R, its meaning has to do with eternal breath in, in proximity to location. 
realm or dimension. In other words, you don't have to leave the ground to get caught up in the air with the Lord. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you, in your midst. Luke chapter 17, verse 21. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The Greeks viewed breath and spirit synonymously. Paul's passages are filled with symbolic language. Clouds often symbolize human, spirit realm beings, and those who have died in the Lord, not atmospheric clouds. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And in Jude, verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees, whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. In the Old Testament, God came against nations in or on clouds. It was through the action of humans or armies. Jesus promised to do the same in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Today for many the idea of a great escape is deceptively appealing. Not having to die and go through the grave. Many are afraid of dying and hope to avoid a trip to the grave to reach heaven. This rapture ideology offers to them a quick and easy way out. It offers the most convenient excuse to avoid for believers the responsibilities that are here on this earth and in this life. The Holy Ghost comforts us by His presence dwelling in our hearts. The scriptures sustain us as we await our personal call into the heavenly realm. In this life on earth, we can unitedly look forward to, as believers in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to see him that day when we shall be like him because we will see him as he is. May the Lord bless us toward a richer, fuller, and more accurate understanding of the Apostles' doctrine. There is no record of any non-Christian writings that report all Christians suddenly disappeared. Always remember to keep the basic hermeneutic principles of audience relevance in mind when you are studying the Scripture. Audience relevance simply says that the Scriptures were written to living people almost 2,000 years ago about the things that were getting ready to happen in their lifetime. Theirs was the generation of the last days. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In conclusion to our Bible lessons on part one and part two of the subject called the rapture. We conclude it here today. We hope that the scriptures have been shown to have you realize that the people that were expecting the Lord to return were expecting him to return in their lifetime in the first century. And so he did return in the year A.D. 70 and has been here ever since. When Jesus said you must be born again 
to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has been here ever since the Lord returned in A.D. 70. Else, when you were born again, where would you go? It's a spiritual kingdom that is here. There is no physical kingdom going to be set up. It is the spiritual kingdom of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Any question, any comment, any email, you can reach us at the New Covenant Apostolic Church at gmail.com. Thank you. I've been crucified with Christ. I've been 